just not many hours ago we were together at the Blue Valley Farm Show building. We're glad to be here this afternoon. We have with us Brother Schroeder from the School of Gilead, who holds a position there as an instructor and also a minister. He's a traveling representative of the Watchtower Bible and Frank Society, and uh, his time is devoted fully uh, to the ministry. The subject that he has chosen for this afternoon is on the subject, Education for Life in the New World. I think you will find this quite interesting. And again, I might say that you will want to put down some of the points in the scriptures that he uses, and we may check them in our homes when we return, which would be a proper thing it's when we get a better understanding of it. So now we'll turn the platform over to Mr. Schroeder. Three months ago, my family and myself attended a convention of Jehovah's Witnesses in Rochester, New York. And we were entertained in the home of one of Jehovah's Witnesses whose husband was not one of Jehovah's Witnesses, but who was uh, a jeweler in the city of Rochester, New York. And so on the second morning, he asked me whether I'd ever uh, visited a jewelry shop. And I said, no, I never had. He said, would I like to do so that morning? He said, I have to go at 8 o'clock and uh, de-alarm my establishment, which is on the ninth floor of a large building, and then uh, I can enter, and my jewelers, I have three of them, uh, come and start work later on. So I agreed to go along, and we went up the elevator, and he's a custom jeweler, does only special work for the uh, people who are able to pay for such type of service. And so we uh, went through several uh, de-alarmed operations and entered this uh, large place. And then he began to uh, take me on a little tour of the jewelry shop and showed me several safes. And so he opened up one safe and uh, brought out an envelope and filled his hands with diamonds. And uh, there was just a, a palm full of glitter. He said, uh, do you know anything about diamonds? I said, uh, not very much. So he said, uh, we have cutters here that cut uh, gems to produce the greatest amount of brilliance. And he said, the diamond stone is the stone that lends itself to the greatest amount of cuttings or facets. And he showed that a diamond uh, can be cut to produce 58 little facets or little faces. And uh, that's why the diamond uh, reproduces the greatest amount of sparkle. And then he showed how each little face sends out a beam of light. And he said it doesn't only send out a beam of white light, but a diamond can send out like a prism uh, all the colors of the rainbow. And he said, the stones are so wonderful, and he showed how they were cut. Well, I said, uh, Mr. Forsyth, I said, uh, you know, the Bible is a wonderful gem, too. And it has many different facets, many different faces. And that brings me to the point of introduction of my lecture this afternoon. Today, we have the greatest gem there is, the Bible. And this, too, has many faces of knowledge. And each face or department sends out a wonderful stream or beam of light. Take, for instance, the Bible. It's the greatest ancient history book. And it gives a vast field of knowledge just in history alone. The Bible is also a geography book of ancient times. And sends out a beam of knowledge there. The Bible is a great book of prophecy and sends out strong beams of knowledge in the field of prophecy. It has the face of knowledge, I mean of uh, law. It's the greatest law book man has today. 
The Bible also has the face of Bible principles. It's a great collection of Bible principles. And so on. So here we have a wonderful divine library of great knowledge. And this knowledge opens up great spiritual light. But you know, more than just uh, having the Bible in your possession and knowing that it can send out these various ranges of light, education is necessary. And that's the subject of our discussion this afternoon, education for life in the new world. You see, we have these various fields of knowledge, and here we must now learn to get discernment and get an understanding of the various prophecies and of the various laws and the various principles and the various fields of knowledge that we find in the Scripture. It's like we learned in the Watchtower some time back. We have light in this room. Now, before we turn on the lights, we have complete darkness at night time. And you can't discern anything in this building, can you, when it's totally dark. But as soon as you turn on the lights, then you can begin to discern. You can see the clock. You can begin to discern the platform. You can discern the uh, microphone. You can begin to discern the uh, stand here. You can discern people. You can focus your attention on various objects. And that's what we call discernment, you see. Well, the same thing is true in the spiritual way. Here we have the Bible in its many fields of knowledge. And it turns on spiritual light. But uh, it's just light in general. But now you've got to begin to focus your mind, uh, mind's eye or attention and begin to discern and study this, the kingdom, and study that about the Abrahamic covenant and study this about this prophecy in that part and dig it out. And there's where your discernment comes in. And that discernment means understanding. And that's education. When you go to school, your school teacher is not only supposed to tell you, give you information, but your school teacher is supposed to give you understanding of that information, uh, try to get it implanted in your mind, and to give you sort of discernment of the various parts of that field of information. And so Jehovah's Witnesses today are trying to be teachers and to really advance education divine education, education in the divine word in connection with this greatest gem that man has, his greatest treasure. You know, this word of God contains knowledge, and then by discernment we can get understanding of it, of information and wisdom that originates from the realm of the invisible. You see, we today are living in the earth, in a physical world, and uh, everything today has height and length and width. And that's the physical world that we live in day to day. And even as you look out into, into space and see the moon and the sun, these are all physical objects that have uh, these three dimensions, these three sizes. But you know, the great God of heaven doesn't uh, live in this field or realm of the visible. No, he lives in the field of the invisible, the realm of the invisible. None of us can see him with our naked eyes. And yet we want to get information from the realm of the invisible to the realm of the visible where we are today and where we're confronted with many problems and where we want to get much information and discernment concerning heavenly purposes. And so it's the Bible that contains the vast field of knowledge which really comes from the realm of the invisible. That's where it originally came from, from God's great mind, the mastermind that directed the writing and the preservation of this information in the scriptures. You know, in the Garden of Eden, uh, we had a sanctuary there. Adam was perfect, Eve was perfect, the garden was perfect. And in the sanctuary, God spoke to Adam directly. God spoke out of the realm of the invisible to Adam who was here on earth in a paradise garden. And so a sanctuary is an arrangement, a place where God's will is done and where God speaks from the realm of the invisible to the realm of the visible. 
Well, we know after Adam's uh, sin, he was cast out of the sanctuary, and uh, in time, the sanctuary of the Garden of Eden came to an end. But uh, years later, God uh, developed an earthly sanctuary in the tabernacle. And uh, God spoke to Moses and to Aaron and the other high priests through the sanctuary from the Most Holy and gave information to men here in the realm of the visible. And incidentally, in a sanctuary, only one will is done, the will of the great God. Everything that went on in the sanctuary, the uh, tabernacle and later in Solomon's temple, everything that was done there every day, the lighting of the uh, incense uh, uh, on the altar and the lighting of the lamp and the putting of the showbread there once a week, all that done was according to law, according to God's written expression in the Bible. So only God's will is done in a sanctuary. And when man tries to do his own will, like Adam did and Eve in the Garden of Eden, then they have to be put outside the sanctuary and are no longer in touch with the realm of the invisible. You remember that uh, King Uzziah got it in his mind that he wanted to offer incense. So he said, I'm a great king here in Israel. I'll just go into the temple myself and I'll offer the incense. It was not God's will for a king to enter the, the sanctuary. And you know, he was smitten with leprosy, was he not? And the priest had to take him out. So there's a great lesson then and now that in God's sanctuary only his will is done. And he gives information from out of the realm of the invisible to his chosen servants. Well, today, in this field of education, it's now developing. Once again, God has a sanctuary organization with a faithful and discreet slave here on the earth. And uh, that sanctuary organization made up of anointed Christians is God's channel for speaking out of the realm of the invisible to us today and to guide our minds in gaining an education from the Bible. And two, in that uh, sanctuary organization, only God's will is done. There's no democratic will. Many people thought years ago that we could have elections and by voting from the congregation we could determine certain purposes of God that had to be done. But no, the Bible shows that that is not the theocratic way and God doesn't make his will known through the minds of the, of the masses. God gives his will out of the invisible through a sanctuary and in our day a sanctuary organization, a sanctuary class and that will is always theocratic, and that will is right, and it comes on down to us, and we carry out God's will. And if there are any who try to uh, exert their own will in certain matters concerning God's purposes, then they're going to get their fingers burned, and they'll have to be disciplined, even like King Uzziah was. So today, our Opportunities of divine education for life in the new world are coming to us through the faithful discreet slave, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, and through its many publications which endeavor to guide our minds and uh, give us the understanding of the various prophecies and the various laws and the various principles as found in this great treasure house, the scriptures. Now then, in our time, this information is coming from the realm of the invisible as stated. Jesus showed that uh, truth is what comes from the realm of the invisible to us today. Even as we saw in the film last night, Martin Luther tried to be champion of what he understood to be Bible truth in his day. So in our day, too, this field of Christian education involves truth. We're no longer interested in fairy tales. We're not interested in fiction. We're not interested in imagination, what people think about certain matters or theories like evolution. No. We today want truth. We want facts. 
We want information that's in harmony with the actual state of things. Our forefathers were fooled and led into various blind ways, but now we're on the threshold of the new world. We don't want to be misled. We want truth. And it's only truth that comes through a sanctuary organization. Every time God spoke to Adam, he spoke truth. Every time God spoke through uh, Aaron and Moses in the sanctuary, say, uh, the uh, tabernacle sanctuary, it was always truth. And every time God spoke through Solomon's temple, it was truth. There was no imagination, no fiction involved. And so now, too, things that are coming to us through the faithless Greek slave, the sanctuary organization today is truth that which is in harmony with the actual state of things. Jesus showed that uh, in John 4, that uh, the time would come, and it was so in his day, and is certainly now true in our day, that uh, we will worship and get information, not from an earthly temple, but we'll worship God in spirit and in truth. If you have your Bibles, we can turn to John 4, uh, starting about the 19th verse. As those of you who may not have your scriptures with you, remember that the setting here is uh, when Jesus went to speak to a Samaritan woman. He was in Samaritan territory. And as you know, the Samaritans had a rival religion to the Jewish religion at Jerusalem. Now the Jews, the scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees had their temple in Jerusalem. But the Samaritans, who were half-breed offspring of the ten tribes, they had built a temple on Mount Gerizim, uh, many miles to the north of Jerusalem. And they built a very fancy temple. You remember when the Israelites came out of uh, the wilderness and conquered the promised land, Moses instructed Joshua, now when you get into the promised land, the first thing you must do is go to Mount Gerizim and pronounce the blessings and on Mount Ebal to pronounce the cursings. You remember that? And so... Long before Jerusalem became the holy mountain city, why, Mount Gerizim had been the place where Joshua had pronounced these blessings. And so the Samaritans thought, now Mount Gerizim is the holy mountain, and therefore they built a temple on that mountain. They said, God uh, uh, used our forefathers, and this is the blessed place where he spoke. But the Jews said, no, Jerusalem is the place. Well, now, with that setting, notice what Jesus said. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive you're a prophet. Our forefathers worship in this mountain. See, she's referring to Mount Gerizim. But you people, meaning you Jews, she knew Jesus was a Jew, but you people say, in Jerusalem is the one place where peoples ought to worship. Now, notice what Jesus said to her. Jesus said to her, Believe me, woman, the hour is coming when neither in this mountain, Mount Gerizim, nor in Jerusalem, Mount Zion, will you people worship the Father. You, Samaritans, he meant, worship what you do not know. Now here the Samaritans had built this temple and imagined that God was speaking to them through their temple, through their sanctuary. But not in all the hundreds of years did God ever speak to the Samaritans through this temple. So Jesus says, uh, you worship what you do not know. You don't have any facts. You don't have any evidence that God speaks to you through your temple. But we, that means the Jews, we worship what we know. God has spoken through the temple, the sanctuary in Jerusalem. Because salvation originates with the Jews. And that's why God spoke through that way out of the realm of the invisible. 
But then he goes on to say, on the contrary, the hour is coming, and it is now, when the genuine worshipers will worship the Father with spirit and truth. For indeed the Father is looking for such kind to worship him. God is a spirit, and those worshiping him must worship with spirit and truth. And so, since Jesus' time, we have not had to go to an earthly mountain upon which there is a temple through which to get information from the realm of the invisible. God now is able to speak to us through true worship, and he in turn wants us to worship him with spirit, realizing that God is spirit, and with truth, with facts, that which is in harmony with the actual state of things. And that Jesus was an authority, and he could tell us what the true situation was. For instance, at John 8.23, in the New World Translation, Jesus said, uh, so he proceeded to say to them, you are from the realms below. I am from the realms above. You are from this world. I am not from this world. Now here was Jesus Christ who was now visible and in the realm that we are today, the physical. But he says, I originally came from the realm of the invisible. Therefore, I know what I'm talking about. And I'm able to give you the truth and the facts as to how you may worship God. And you've got to worship him now with spirit and with truth. There's no visible temple any longer needed. So Jesus, as a great educator then, gave us facts, gave us information, gave us truth that we're able to serve him. And then we, don't, we won't be like the Samaritans who have merely an imagination where they thought God was speaking to them. Now take, for instance, um, the doctrine of the Trinity. There are many people that believe that Jehovah God is can be described, I mean not Jehovah God, but that the Godhead is described by God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, three persons in one Godhead. Now then, uh, is that true? Is that a fact? Is that reality? Well, those who advocate the Trinity are mere men like Augustine, and uh, other Catholic Church fathers and Protestant fathers now. Well, who are they? Have they ever gone to the realm of the invisible to see what God looks like? Were they there to be able to give us the facts? No. So what they've been talking about is mere human imagination. So why should we accept such things as a description of what God is? But here we have Jesus Christ one who actually came from the realm of the invisible and came here and bore true testimony that my Father is greater than I, that God is the great Spirit and he's the fountainhead of life. Jesus gave us the facts. Jesus gave us the right conception of the living God. I remember uh, last summer I was mentioning this thing, how, for example, the Trinity was really based on mere imagination not based on truth. And there was a Catholic priest in the audience and uh, he requested uh, uh, an audience with me afterwards. And um, so the district servant and myself talked to him for about an hour. And so we put him on the spot and I said, well, if you say the Trinity is a fact, can you prove it? Who are your authorities? Well, he mentioned Augustine. Yes, but was Augustine ever in heaven? Did he ever see the God, true God? How does he know what he looks like? He's only a mere man like you and I, who had a mother and born in sin and shade and iniquity. He's just speaking out of his own mental imagination. He can't give us any facts. Now here's Jesus Christ. He said, my father's greater than I. And uh, all the other evidence that he gave. So we are justified in concluding that what you call a trinity is not based on truth and fact. It's not in harmony with the actual state of things. The great God of heaven is the greatest personage. 
He's the great sovereign. He's the greatest reality there is. He doesn't share that in a threefold way with two others. And that's why we as Jehovah's Witnesses are teachers of truth. We're educators of truth. We're giving the real facts to the people. Well, then he jumped on hellfire. Well, I said, there again, uh, have any of your organization ever been in hell and seen the fires there and burning forever and ever? Has anyone ever come back from hell to give us the evidence as you claim there is? Now, the Bible, which is a true channel, and Jesus Christ, who actually came back from Hades, from hell, he was there parts of three days. He gives us no information about a burning, sizzling hell there. So there again, we as Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe in such fairy tales or such imaginations. We've got to see things as they're found in the Bible. And if they are found here, then we take them as fact. And then we are able to preach fact and truth. And that's the education that's important. Well, then he went on to the name Jehovah. That didn't appear in the uh, Greek scriptures, he said. Well, now there again, I said, do you know all the facts? Now, why is it that for several hundred times, the Greek word kyrios, which in English is Lord, uh, does not have a definite article in front of it? it? According to Greek grammar, it should be ho kyrios. But for more than... 200 times, it's always just Kyrios. Kyrios did this, and Kyrios said that. And uh, such is evidence by, from the ancient scholars that when they took the name Jehovah out, they only put Kyrios in its place and did not put whole Kyrios because Jehovah never has a definite article. You never speak of the Jehovah. And so they only put Kyrios... So therefore, it makes it ungrammatical. And every time you read the Greek, it stands out like a sore thumb. I mean, if you're really are reading Greek. And so there's Jehovah, Jehovah, Jehovah every time. And the same thing is true with the um, Greek scriptures, the Septuagint Greek scriptures. When they took the name Jehovah out more than 6,000 times, they just put Kyrios without a definite article. So there's a standing proof but even the, the real scholars know themselves. Well, he didn't know that. And so I said there again, we as Jehovah's Witnesses are preaching truth and are preaching fact, actually as we find it from this great fountainhead of truth, the Bible. Well, in getting the divine education, it's interesting how Jehovah in having this uh, field of knowledge preserved for us, had much of it preserved for us in symbol. So God uh, really speaks to us from out of the realm of the invisible to the realm of visible by using various symbols. And these symbols uh, express to you the reality, that which is in harmony with the actual state of things. Now let's just take an illustration of that. Uh, in the new book, Your Will Be Done on Earth, it gives us this illustration in um, uh, Revelation, the fourth chapter, if you have that available, in the New World Translation. The interesting thing about the fourth chapter of uh, Revelation, that uh, here we have an amazing record that will enable the true student of the scriptures to get an intellectual understanding and uh, vision, you might say, of understanding, discernment of the living God himself. Now, it's impossible for us to go to the realm of the invisible. God knows that. No man can see God and live. God is a consuming fire. But the great God took such uh, loving interest in us that he actually uh, preserved in the Bible, and this is one of the few places, symbols that enable, uh, him, enables him to convey to our minds impression of truth as to who he is. And since Jehovah's Witnesses have the name Jehovah's Witnesses, it means that 
They must know Jehovah. Otherwise, how can you be a witness for him if you don't know Jehovah? You must have the right conception of God before you can be a witness for him. And here is one of the several scriptures that enables us as Jehovah's Witnesses to get the right understanding about God and to say that we do know God. Well, now let's take a little trip. We go with John. We don't have to go into a spaceship. We're not going to go to the moon or to uh, uh, Mars or Venus, anything like that, because that's still in the realm of the visible, and that wouldn't get, get us anywhere. No matter if we went way to the nebulae, way out, we're still in the, in the realm of the visible. We want to get from the realm of the visible into the invisible. There's we want to have our minds transported so that we can, in a, in a truthful impression, say that we have seen God with our eyes of understanding. So now we're ready for this trip. Now verse 4 starts, After these things I saw and look an open door in heaven. Now this open door is not an outer space. It's not around the moon or the sun, anything like that. But this is an open door uh, into the realm of the invisible, in heaven. That means in the realm of the invisible. And the first voice that I heard was as of a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come on up here. So now we get the invitation to come and actually go by our mind's discernment into the realm of the invisible. Let's have a wonderful experience in gaining some discernment as to God. Come on up here. So we go. And I shall show you the things uh, with which, uh, which must take place. So John went up there in the realm of the invisible and got a survey of events that are to take place in the future. And of course, these are recorded in the rest of the book of Revelation. But what we're interested in is that at this point is a discernment of God. Now, after these things, I immediately came under the Spirit's power, showing it's God's active force. And look, now we're in the realm of the invisible, and we see a throne, something like a throne. Now, a throne is a symbol. And remember that God is now conveying to us, in our minds, truth or fact, that which is in harmony with the actual state of things, but he's using visible uh, symbols. Now here a throne is a symbol. And to us, in the realm of the visible, it always means that here you've got a throne of ruling authority and somebody is sitting on it who's a ruler. So now in our mind, we must get that conception that here we're now before the presence of God, who is a great heavenly ruler. Now a throne was in its position in heaven. Notice this. Now, the Russian scientists and the Americans think that they're going to get into the ultimate position. That's why they're trying to get out to the moon or uh, other places. But even the ultimate position of the realm of the visible still wouldn't be the real ultimate position that dominates. That's in the realm of the invisible. And here we are uh, before Jehovah God because the throne is in its position, in the ultimate position in heaven. And there is one seated upon this throne. And so there, we're now going to get the truthful information as to this majestic uh, dignity, uh, greatest personage, the Ancient of Days, in heaven. And the one seated is in appearance. So now, God is going to give to our mind the discernment, just what it's like to be in his presence. Now, if we were an angel and actually came into God's presence, we would get the same experience and reaction as we're now going to get through the symbols. The one seated is in appearance like a jasper stone and a precious red-colored stone. And around about the throne, there's a rainbow like an emerald in appearance. So now here are these precious stones and uh, now, as I mentioned in my introduction, I only saw a fistful of diamonds. But when you get a fistful of diamonds, you're just lost in amazement and lost in wonderment at all the sparkling. You, you can't get your eyes 
off those diamonds, a whole fistful of them. But now, here, we have a vast uh, uh, expanse, all jasper stone and precious red color stone. So you're just lost in a wonderment and amazement. Here you are in the appearance and in the audience of the living God. So there's the truthful reaction. When an angel comes into God's presence, he's just amazed. And uh, he just can't get his eyes off God. It's just so all wonderful and uh, uh, it just takes your every gaze. And that's the, the reaction that we get here. When you look upon gems that continually glitter, your eyes are just fastened there. And then also that around the throne there's a rainbow like an emerald. And uh, uh, emerald green just gives you a reaction of serenity, peace. Nothing ever disturbs God. And anyone that comes in his presence, everything is calm, orderly. Nothing disturbs him. And that's the wonderful reaction in coming before the living God. And so that's the reaction that we get by merely using these stones, these gems. And so that's the conveying of truth to us from the realm of the invisible here where we are right now. And then it's further described by other symbols, the activity around God's throne. We don't have time to go into that. But the point that I want to demonstrate here is that this whole Bible is full of amazing symbols. And when you study those symbols in the realm of the visible, it conveys to you truthful fact and that which is in harmony with things in the realm of the invisible. So that's why we as Jehovah's Witnesses can say now, we know our God. We have seen him. We have seen him through symbols, through the word of God. And the reaction that we get is just as if we were an angel and did appear personally in the appearance of the living God. So that's why we can go out and be Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, while we're on this point, uh, the true education, and by getting these facts, builds up real faith. Uh, a few months back, it was last March, the Lutheran group at Cornell uh, asked me to come and give them a talk, and so another instructor, myself, Brother Redford, went to the um, place where they met on the campus, and I gave them a little half-hour talk, and then afterwards again it was thrown open to questions. And uh, one of the Lutheran students got up and said, now, just what is faith? He said, I've been trying to get a satisfactory answer for a long time, and the clergyman was sitting right there with all the students. Well, I said, uh, perhaps you know that the greatest definition of faith is found at Hebrews 11, 1. And so I proceeded to read that and uh, uh, try to give him discernment on the various parts. Faith is the assured expectation. Now, anyone who has faith, he must be expecting something. Now, what are you expecting? Now, this is an assured expectation of something. Now, it must be an assured expectation of things hoped for, for the evident demonstration of realities, though not beheld. Now, uh, things that you have your, ba your faith based on must be realities. Now, if your faith is based on a trinity, that's not a reality. That's a fiction. That's a fable. That's a mere imagination. But faith has to be based on something real. Now, we as Jehovah's Witnesses have our faith based on the greatest reality there is, the great sovereign God, who is the one and only living God. Now, we have evident demonstration of this reality. God speaks to us through his word, through the symbols we have in the Bible, as just mentioned in Revelation 4. And we have experience with God through his organization. 
Now there we get actual evident demonstration. We have experience. And now what are the things we're looking for? What are the things that we're hoping for? Not a Cadillac motor car or a fur coat or anything like that. We're looking for life, everlasting life, life everlastingly here on earth or in heaven. That's the thing we're looking for. And God gives us great demonstrations uh, and evidence in the Bible. And therefore, our faith is based on truth, on realities, not on foolish things. And so, as we know, many people say they have faith, but their faith is just built on sand, is it not? It's based on unrealities, things that don't actually exist. So then, ladies and gentlemen, Jehovah's Witnesses in their great educational campaign for life in the new world are trying to give you from the Bible the truth, the facts. Now, notice I've said several times, or that which is in harmony with the actual state of things. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, is the Battle of Armageddon a fact yet? No, because it hasn't come to pass. But now the Bible, however, tells us in symbols uh, that which is going to be in harmony with the reality when that time comes. So in other words, the Bible contains prophecy in symbols, and that's the only way God gives us future information or information about the future, and it's absolutely in harmony with reality when that time comes. The book of Daniel has been a great mystery for a long time. Jehovah's Witnesses now at their great convention at Yankee Stadium, the Polo Grounds in 1958 called the Divine Will Assembly, there received a wonderful gift, a further study of the book of Daniel. And Daniel is just full of symbols. And those symbols are all conveying truth fact, and that which is in harmony with the actual state of things when the time comes. We study this book at uh, the Watchtower Bible School of Gilead. It's one of our textbooks, and uh, in my personal opinion, it's one of the finest textbooks we've ever had, and Jehovah's Witnesses are offering it to you, the public, and we are now using it as a study aid in all our congregations. We'd like to advise you all getting a copy. Now, most of the Bible, that is the earlier part of it, gives us historical fact of things that happened during the period of the typical theocracy, the government of natural Israel and Judea. The book of Daniel gives us a record of what happened and what will yet happen during the period of the Gentiles. The book of Daniel specializes on the 2,520 years, the seven times of the Gentiles, and what will happen at the end of those seven times. And it's the only book in the Bible, along with Revelation, that gives you the information about the time of the end in great detail. When you start examining the book of Daniel, you'll see how uh, clever Jehovah God, the mastermind, was in putting in symbol form uh, amazing truthful information and which is just now beginning to be unlocked by us. The second chapter of Daniel gives us an overall pattern of the Gentile type of rule. And there we see a uh, progressive prophetic image with a head of gold and the uh, breasts of silver and the belly of brass and the legs of iron and the feet of iron and clay. So chapter 2 gives us the overall pattern. And then Daniel opens up further and we really have a circus, a Gentile circus that is described in the book of Daniel. 
Now the next, uh, and this, this circus is in three acts. The first act is uh, described in the seventh chapter where we have a, the performance, performance of four beasts, four animals. And everything that they do, and it's recorded, all in symbol, uh, is an amazing uh, historic record of the past and of the immediate future of the operations of the Gentile powers. And it's uh, giving, filling out details of chapter 2, which just gives us the blueprint of the whole over, overall period. Well, now then, after that act is finished, and that act is complete in all its details, now we come to another act. And the second act, which is specialized on chapter 8 of Daniel, is where we have the performance of just two animals, the ram and the he-goat. And out of the he-goat comes a little horn. And our whole attention is on, the, uh, on that act. And that whole act gives us, by symbol, amazing facts and truth most of which has happened, some of it is yet in the immediate future. So we examine that whole thing and uh, get amazing information. Now then, uh, and that covers overall the same sweeping time of the Gentiles. And then we come to the last act, the third act, Daniel 11th chapter. And here we have a performance of two kings king of the south and the king of the north and they go through some very fancy antics but here again we have the same sweeping from the beginning of the Gentile time that is early on right on through our day and into the immediate future each of these acts goes back and uh, gives us information over the entire period again now some people think well why did Jehovah God four times go over the same history in a general way. It's true, but each time there are different details. And that's where discernment comes in. And that's where education comes in to find these. And it's amazing what is opened up as far as factual information is concerned. And that Jehovah's Witnesses have done in their wonderful new book, Your Will Be Done on Earth. You know, one educator in the old world says there are three secrets to education. And um, the second secret is like the first secret, repetition. And the third is like the first. So the three secrets are repetition, repetition, repetition. And Jehovah God, the greatest educator, repeats many, many times. Why? Because he knows the necessity to get these things sunk in for real discernment. But he gives it to us from various different angles. Now, of course, an unwise person says, well, that's a waste of time. Is it? Now let's take a look at Jesus Christ. Do you know Jehovah God produced 332 prophecies concerning the coming of Messiah. He repeated this 332 times. Now, how was God clever in doing that? Well, now let's say we have an artist. And an artist is going to make a sketch. Now, if an artist uh, should make 332 strokes. Do you think he would be able to produce a pretty accurate picture? Yes. So Jehovah God, by 332 prophecies, painted a most accurate prophetic description of the one who's to become the Messiah. God was so careful and repetitious in painting it from the various different angles. Why? That it would be impossible for the devil to produce a fake. He couldn't produce a man 
who would come in appearance and fit all those 332 strokes. So when the time came, when he walked the earth, Messiah, here he was, Jesus Christ. And did he look 100% like that image that God had painted by prophecy hundreds of years before? Absolutely. There wasn't a one stroke mistake. And so to be impossible for the true ones who were looking for the divine education to make a mistake as to who the Messiah was. So that's why it was so important that God repeat himself 332 times and he put the devil on the spot. The devil couldn't produce a fake, a fake Messiah. Well, now the same thing is true in our day. Here we are, we're facing the greatest battle the earth has ever seen. And uh, God has foretold that he's going to have an organization, a group of people that he's amazingly going to give education to and uh, build them up, uh, give them truth, give them fact, and give them future information, keep them together, keep them clean, keep them on the right track, and keep expanding them and carry them right through the Battle of Armageddon. And that's God's objective. But now there again, God hasn't only produced one prophecy for telling an organized effort to have a flock that will carry through people of goodwill. He didn't make 10 prophecies. He didn't make 20 prophecies, but he's made scores of prophecies. Why? For the same reason as he made in connection with Jesus Christ. Now we have scores of prophetic sketches of this new world society that in the last days, what it would do, how you'd get into it, what you'd have to do to be an associate and all that. Why? That it'd be impossible for the devil to produce a fake organization that would fool mankind. He's tried to produce many fake organizations like say, the various Protestant religious organizations and the Catholic religious organization, but uh, Some of these organizations may fit only one of those prophecies slightly from an angle, but to fit 50 prophecies, impossible. But here we have Jehovah's Witnesses. We have 42 prophecies alone that sketch in detail the great crowd, what they must do now, before Armageddon, in order to be carried through and eventually get everlasting life here on the earth. And then we have more than that prophecies about the little flock and all things that they must do. And all these together form the new world society that are getting the real education that will carry them through. So ladies and gentlemen, let's get the facts. And the Bible is so designed that uh, it gives knowledge, light, and discernment to only one type of organization. The Bible supports theocratic organization. It doesn't support democratic organization. The Bible lends itself to be used by a sanctuary organization where information is conveyed from the realm of the invisible to us in the realm of the visible what we must now do and what we can expect in the near future and how we may build ourselves up and educate ourselves for life in the new world. Well, now you may say, uh, that's wonderful here, but uh, what about other parts of the world? What about Russia, for instance? Well, Jehovah God's arm is not short. It's true that there are congregations of Jehovah's Witnesses now in Russia that are springing up all over the country. It's an amazing thing that's happening in Russia. 20 years ago, Jehovah's Witnesses in this country just didn't know how the truth would ever reach behind the Iron Curtain and how uh, they would be given truthful information from the scriptures uh, and be built up like we are and get ready for life in the new world. But now what's coming, information that's coming through to us is amazing. And God, by means of the Holy Spirit and the Bible that's in that country, now we find Jehovah's Witnesses are all over. 
And they refer to Jehovah's Witnesses now as spider webs. And the communists have now complained. They've got spider webs in almost every city in, in, in communist Russia. And the government is trying to sweep out these cobwebs, destroy them. But it seems as fast as they destroy them, the spiders are busy and they uh, make a bigger web. And so now there are thousands and thousands of Jehovah's Witnesses coming out. And uh, uh, you've heard uh, in re in the, within the last several months there have been many articles published in Russia, in Pravda, about activities of Jehovah's Witnesses. And of course, giving the communist angle and version of it. Well, a short time back, uh, Russia has a picture magazine like Life magazine. And their picture magazine is called The Crocodile. And The Crocodile had eight pictures uh, a short time back trying to convey to millions of the Russian people uh, how our underground organization works. They had what they call a, a, a sort of a kingdom hall where out in the country there was sort of a manure pile and, no, excuse me, there was a straw heap and, uh, and underneath that uh, straw stack there was a little hall where uh, meetings were held. And it may very well have been true and the, and the government just found out. Anyway, they had a picture of that place where brothers held meetings. And then they had a picture of a manure pile under which they found copies of the Watchtower and uh, other publications. And so they tried to, they've given eight pictures here of the underground activity. And then they had a little article about these, oh yes, and this whole article is called Spiders and how they're operating. I'd like to read a few extracts uh, showing you the educational campaign that's going on there. Of course, this is giving you the communist slant of it, but it's giving evidence that Jehovah's Witnesses are powerfully busy there. And of course, they exaggerate some of the uh, work. These are spiders. Spiders do not like the light. They spin their clever webs in dark corners. They creep away and wait until the victims are enmeshed in the tangles of the web and victims fall into it. So they're admitting that we've got webs all over and the people falling into it or coming into the truth, you might say. At midnight, when the village is already slumbering by back passages, come people to the shack. Now this is the shack under the straw stack. They sit down on benches and already is heard the soulful cry. Armageddon is coming, the hour is close, Jehovah is coming to the earth, thunder and lightning, to battle with Satan. Now that's their imagination, what they think is going on at these Kingdom Hall meetings. And then they try to imagine what it might be to be there. Sorrowful faces, vacant glasses, glances, trembling figures. So begins the usual study, the meeting of the Jehovistic sect, or as they call themselves, the witnesses of the God Jehovah. Jehovah God is an ancient manifestation biblical. However, the witnesses have appeared only recently, in the second half of the last century. Up to that time, the world got on very well without them. Well, we might say the world got along very well without the communists, too. <laughs> but capitalism could not get on without them. It required a force which would try to interfere with the young socialistic movement in Europe, a force which would plant a spirit of blind obedience in the colonies. And then the commercialist Russell announced in Brooklyn a new sect. Well subsidized by dollars, the servants of Jehovah started spinning webs in different countries, recruiting brothers and sisters without sparing expenses. They have had and have numerous congresses and conferences. They edit the journal, the Watchtower, as they write themselves in about 50 languages. Grown, the day of Jehovah is near, announces the Watchtower, Armageddon approaches. Armageddon is a terrible battle between Jehovah and the satanic powers, as a result of which the earth will be burned, uncountable numbers of believers will perish. There will remain only a few righteous ones who will be worthy of a glorious life in paradise. Nowadays, associated with Armageddon is also the atomic and hydrogen warfare. It is well known who are the satanic powers, socialistic countries, communists, 
adherents of the international freedom movements and so on. So they sort of put the glove on themselves, don't they? The Jehovahists have their own aims, their own moral. Now notice how they twist scriptures. Quote, be as quiet as doves and as poisonous as snakes. <laughs> now that's just opposite what the scriptures say. The spider is quiet. The spider is poisonous. And so he has crawled into the town of Beliar in the shape of Mary Knizabek. She apparently is the publisher. During the war years, this woman, known for her easy morals, of her own accord went to Germany. Having returned to the Soviet Union, she became engaged in this business. In other words, she went to Germany in the concentration camps and learned the truth. Now, they say she had easy morals. Now, the background of this sister, which we learned later through England, uh, and through a brother who was in Russia when this thing was published, and he's a Russian brother from Cleveland. Now, they called her a woman of easy morals. But what happened was, when they arrested this sister, as we shall see later, uh, they forced her to be violated by communist soldiers so that they could say she was a woman of easy morals. And then she became pregnant and they took the child away from her to be given a state education. Now, so they brand her now as a woman of easy morals. But they're the ones that violated her. Is this not a su suitable woman for an organizer of the Jehovahistic group? Uh, Knezeve starts preaching Armageddon. Impress the people not to assign to peace. She instructed a brother in the sect by the name of Tilholes, friendship between the nation means enmity with God. Into this Jehovistic faith, Knezeve was converted by a certain, I can't pronounce the name. Uh, his sharp eyes noted her and he recruited her. And she listened to him, for he, he is as twice the scoundrel that she is. And in his past, Brauskas collaborated with the Hitlerites. He could use the auto automatic well and served in the brown swastika detachments, shooting Soviet uh, people. Now he repeats the commandments, do not kill, and calls upon the Jehovists to refuse military service. Incidentally, when they arrest congregation servants and others in the underground, they always convict them of immorality or committing a crime of rape or something like that because they want to uh, build up in the minds of the Russian people that we're a criminal society, a society of unclean men and women, you see. That's their uh, evil, wicked bent here. Well, uh, then is described uh, how the brothers do their work. And incidentally, uh, the, the, the literature that they find indicates what an amazing organization they have and how up-to-date they are. The servants of Jehovah are not content to agitate merely by word of mouth. Sometimes they manage to receive from Brooklyn the Watchtower, the Kingdom Ministry, and letters addressed, My dear brother. Notice the Kingdom Ministry gets to them. The sheet of organization instructions of Jehovah's Witnesses that come out every month. It finally gets into Russia, too. Well, then it's described uh, how they have a fund of good hope so the brothers are even taking up collecting and the work that we're doing. Yet they're the ones that are working with the Rockefellers. With a good broom, the cobwebs. So they admit they're having the trouble getting rid of all the cobwebs of Jehovah's Witnesses. Which have already appeared in the corners. The main thing is preventive disinfection. So that's what they're trying to do, disinfect the people's minds against being talked to by Jehovah's Witnesses. We have plenty of means of preventives. It would be well to use them in a sensible way, on a large scale. And so that's what they're trying to do, trying to get the people now to refuse to listen to Jehovah's Witnesses. And so this large crocodile, backed up by the king of the north, is beginning to shed tears and be alarmed about a little spider group known as Jehovah's Witnesses, whom they say now is endangering the entire king of the north uh, set up in their land.
We also have an uh, interesting uh, report from Poland, where the work is growing very rapidly during this time, even though behind the Iron Curtain. Here's an interesting report came a few weeks ago. The priest in the village of Cade, on a certain Sunday, the priest preached a sermon that made a big impression on all present. He said that Jehovah's Witnesses and primitive or original Christianity are one and the same. They should be heard because they are preaching the true teachings of the Bible. I know these matters, and I'm sorry to state that the foundation of the Catholic Church is not built on the truth. Words from a priest. In other words, the Catholic doctrine is built, built on imagination, fiction, sand. For this reason, I am here today for the last time. After this, he started to solemnly take off his priestly garments and hung them up on the railing of the pulpit. And then he went to the center of the church and told the astonished parishioners, whoever wants to come with me, let him come ahead. And quite a group separated and followed him. Others became doubtful and confused. At this time, the priest is being further trained as one of Jehovah's Witnesses. Another report from Poland. A director's wife learns about Jehovah's Witnesses and the truth. Do the efforts put forth in the field service in the town of J.G., one of the Lord's other sheep was found. It was hard for her at first to get accustomed to God's law and ways because she was a director's wife and was used to another type of life. But her love for righteousness overcame this as well as being aided by a zealous sister. Her husband, interested in her character, Notice an amazing change for the better. He asked, what has happened to you? You do not grumble anymore like you used to when I came home from work. Now this has all disappeared. He did not know that the frequent visits of Jehovah's Witnesses had made this change in his wife. Today, this director's wife is our sister, a regular kingdom publisher, and she is gathering in other sheep. By her regularly attending all the meetings, she's an encouragement to all. Now, there's evidence of the educational work of Jehovah's Witnesses behind the Iron Curtain. So no matter where on this globe you are today, Jehovah God is making available an amazing educational program, above ground like in this country or underground like in Poland and, and in Russia. But the honest-hearted people are being reached and Jehovah God is feeding these people through his wonderful word, the Bible. The Bible speaks the same things in Russia, underground, by means of these symbols, as he speaks to us above the ground here by these same symbols. So you ladies and gentlemen, we invite you to learn more about these wonderful things and about uh, strengthening your faith to get life in God's wonderful new world. The truth will make you free. The Bible is the amazing source of spiritual knowledge. And now let Jehovah's Witnesses help you to get the discernment of that knowledge, what that knowledge means to you, and how to apply that knowledge, that your faith may be strengthened, and that you too may have the blessed hope and opportunity to survive and to live forever on a paradise earth.